Well, hello everyone and welcome back to The Debrief brought to you in partnership between British Rowing and Junior Rowing News. My name is Fergus Mainland, host of the End of the Island podcast. And this week for our Paralympic Games uh, preview episode, I'm delighted to be joined by two Olympic champions, Tom Agar and Grace Clough. So Tom and Grace, delighted to have you join us for this preview episode. Obviously the Paralympic Games kicking off next week, 24th of August to the 5th of September and the rowing taking place between the 27th and the 29th of August. And Grace, coming to you first of all, we've seen the athletes are flying out. They're now in their, in their pre-games camp, effectively. What, what's happening at these pre-Olympic camps or pre-Paralympic Games camps, I should say? What sort of stages are they, are they taking place and, um, and what, what activities are they doing at the moment? Um, so I think what's taking place is obviously they're having to go into a bit of an isolation bubble before they can get themselves into the village. Um, so in the, the holding camp that they're in right now, it will help with their jet lag. Um, so they've come straight off the plane and straight into the holding camp. They are doing land-based training, so there's nowhere for them to row. So they're on the rowing machines inside and then there's weights. And uh, I've seen from footage on Instagram that they're also doing a bit of swimming. Um, but yeah, it's basically getting them ready to then get across to the village where they can get back into the boats um, and start rowing and prepare themselves for racing. And, and Tom, when, when you went out uh, race and, and did your respective of Paralympic Games, were you nervous at this point or was this sort of a period that you could actually just enjoy it and start taking in some of the country that you were, you were racing in? Yeah, in some ways, I think because they're in the holding camp, they're kind of away from the, the bubble of the village and hopefully just be able to settle in and, and recover from the travel uh, and just get used to that, that, just that, the, the humidity, the heat and get over the jet lag is the sort of main main priority. But they will feel that something, something pretty special is coming. Um, and I'm sure they'll feel that sort of air of expectation that's just, you know, the event's just around the corner. But in some ways, they'll be trying to, I guess, kind of stick to sort of training camp mode where they're just, you know, day in, day out, trying to do the simple things right and just uh, just get used to the, the environment over there. So, Tom, for the, the Paralympic Games, we've got three crews out racing. We've got a single, we've got the mixed double and the mixed coxed four. Before we start looking ahead as to into some of the racing, are you able just to, to, to describe some of the, the, the respective Paralympic categories and, and what kind of athletes are able to, to race in each, each category depending on their disability? Yeah, of course, there's been quite a few changes from, from the previous games to this game, one being the, the naming of the actual um, events now. So the PR1 category is for the, uh, the men's and women's single. Uh, and as those are for the rowers who have got sort of minimal or very restricted trunk movement. And typically they've got those, those athletes who be wheelchair users, uh, predominantly sort of spinal injuries mainly, um, or amputees. And, and those guys will row in a fixed seat boat uh, with strapping, which is now called a, a safety strap. And you'll see they have a kind of a backrest which to provide them with extra support and also those flotation devices on, on the side. Uh, so that's the PR1 men's and women's single. Uh, the PR2 category is a mixed double event, so uh, male and female athlete compete in also a fixed seat boat, and um, those boats typically don't have a backrest, and those rowers are able to use their full trunk function, um, so they'll get a much longer reach, much longer stroke, and obviously be able to really drive through the hips, and as a result, it's a much more powerful stroke. Uh, so that's the PR2 category, and then we move to the PR3 category, so uh, uh, PR3 category for the Paralympic event is the, obviously, what was previously called the LTA Mixed Cox 4, where we've got a mixed gender boat again with two male athletes and two female athletes. And it's obviously a Cox boat, so a Cox 4, where you've got um, a Cox in there as well, um, which makes it a little bit of extra challenging being a slightly heavier boat for, for the athletes to uh, pull down the course. And, and Grace, if we start to look at the first of these events, whether the PR1 single, we've got Ben Pritchard racing on, on the men's side of things. How is it racing as racing as an individual by yourself at the, at the Paralympic Games? Obviously, it's Ben's first Paralympic Games. He had he's had quite the journey to get here, Ben. And uh, how do you think he's going to get on out in, out in Tokyo? Um, so I think what's really important to say, and I think Ben and obviously Tom, I think will be a big, strong believer in this, is that he might be the one racing, but there's a huge team behind him as well. Um, so he's definitely not a one man show. There's huge support, physios, coaches, um, the medical staff, um, all there for like supporting that one athlete. Um, but maybe Tom actually might be best describing Ben's experience as a, as a, 
I mean, this is the first event that Tom will not be racing in it at the Paralympics. So it must be exciting for Tom to be on the other side of it, watching, not competing. <laughs> yeah, most definitely, Grace. I think it's, you know, quite unique. I've been to all the Paralympic regattas so far by this one. I think there's only a few athletes that have been uh, to the previous three and are also competing in this one. So it is quite nice to be able to sit on the other side of it and watch uh, and see Ben's progress, uh, his progression really over the past few years. And I'm sure you would have, you know, spent a bit of time with Ben when you were on the team and see him kind of come into the team as a sort of a real development athlete, really. Um, and he, you know, had an accident, um, I think it was 2016. So just around the sort of the, the year the Rio Games was. And uh, he very quickly, a bit like me, switched his attention to getting back into sport and was a bit, you know, an amateur uh, triathlete and, and pretty handy cyclist by, by all accounts. So he really threw himself into, into the rowing and, um, you know, testament to, to his hard work and, and effort and obviously being in and amongst, you know, one of the best supported teams and probably the most knowledgeable team. He's able to really thrive in that environment. And, um, you know, we, the first couple of years of this, this this cycle, we had Andrew Houghton, Andy Houghton, who competed, I think, 2017 and 18. And then I think it was a bit of a tussle between Ben and Andy to get that, that spot um, as we've moved into those last couple of years as we moved towards, towards Tokyo. And he's, you know, a real hot metal prospect now, which is pretty impressive. Um, I think he's really found some phenomenal speeds. You know, he's got the size, strength um, and the real, you know, that right mindset to really sort of keep pushing himself on in the single uh, and working with you know Tom Dyson and Nick Baker and um, with the, you know the GB Rowan team and in and amongst all the other established athletes and the other events, you know he's become you know someone to really really watch uh, as we move towards Tokyo. I'd just like to add, having having watched him train, obviously the big man himself, Tom, uh, he's someone that taught me a lot about being an athlete. But Ben is an athlete that knows how to hurt himself and knows when to dig deep, uh, and it's been a real privilege to be able to kind of watch him do that. I was there at. Uh, the indoor rowing championships when he broke the world record and uh, he just knows how to go into that hole by blinkers on and uh, race his heart out so I think he's been mentored by Tom Agar as well so I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure that's helped along the way <laughs> yeah I don't know he's kind of creating his own history though because he you know I think the first time I really heard of him in, in a real serious way and I you know I really really took notice was when I think he, he competed in one of the um, Welsh indoor championships over a kilometer and I think his time was you know, within a second or two, or very close to my sort of personal best, I sent Nick Baker a message and said, have you, have you seen Ben's score? And I think this is at the sort of point when he was in and around the sort of development team and and kind of training pretty much on his own with support of, you know, some of the, the talent ID athletes and, and support, uh, sorry, coaches um, at the time. And yeah, it, you know, I think he really started to make people sit up and notice. And then since he's been on the team and and had that opportunity to train really consistently, consistently as Grace has said, you know, he, uh, you know, he's got a real engine on him and, you know, he's got some real heart and desire. And I think he wants to be right at the top of that, uh, right at the top of that field. So, Grace, we already touched on the fact that he's uh, hopefully hotly in contention for a medal. But who are the, some of the, who are the other standout nations or standout athletes in the, in the PR1 men's single skull who could also be challenging for those gold, silver and bronze medals? Uh, so we've got probably two quite hot contenders in, in that event. So the three of them, I think, will be tussling it out. We've got the Ukrainian and the uh, Australian, Eric. Um, so those two have been tussling it out for a couple of years now, like 2017, 2018, both of those, which, which uh, Ben was not racing in, both of those two kind of fighting it out for that, that top spot. Um, Eric in 2017 won, and then the Ukrainian in 2018 won. And I think the Ukrainian also won in 2019 as well. So, um, and then we just have the Europeans, was that May, May time um, where Ben was racing against the Ukrainian? So I think, uh, yeah, there's going to be a big tussle for the top three there. Um, and it would be really, really exciting to watch. I think Tom just touched about something which actually is really uh, also exciting. These are the first games where it'll be over two kilometres, not one kilometre. So Tom just touched upon like watching Ben race a one kilometre race. That's what we both competed in. And um, so they've doubled the race over the, this Olympiad, which has added uh, a lot more excitement in the race. Um, especially in these the smaller boats where uh, if you get your race plan wrong, you could be uh, no, blowing up and uh, not making it to that finish line. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. We really saw that, I think, as well. If you go back a couple of years, you mentioned sort of 2017, 18, the first couple of years of this cycle between, you know, it was a real hotly contested, you know, who's going to be that top spot between Eric and, and Roman Polyansky from Ukraine. And, you know, we saw Polyansky typically going off and, you know, really quick, really quick starting uh, fashion as he does. And Eric Corey sort of slowly 
you know, pulling him in towards those last final meters. And, um, you know, it's been within a second of a couple of those events over, you know, sort of a nine, nine and a half minute race and just, you know, down to less than a second. It's, you know, there's been some incredible racing. Um, and I think just the last year or so, I think Polianski's really put himself in that sort of gold medal contention. Um, and But you'd never discount Eric Corey. You know, he's got loads, loads of experience. Uh, you know, he trains very, very professionally and he's part of a really good setup as well. So I know he will be looking to really uh, get himself in the mix for that gold medal, which has kind of evaded him for the past two, two cycles, really. If you think, you know, he's silver in London, uh, where he was a relative newcomer to the event, and then silver again in Rio, just behind Roman Polianski. I'm sure he's looking for uh, revenge on the water this year to try and uh, really push Roman Polianski from, from Ukraine. So, Tom, would you have preferred the opportunity to race 2,000 metres? Are you quite happy sticking with uh, the shorter co or course at the 1K? <laughs> it's a good question. I think uh, probably in the early years, I would have definitely said one kilometre. Um, but I was probably more suited to sort of a, you know, sort of a power endurance sport. But um, I think as, you know, as time went on, I kind of found the, you know, my strength in, in the longer distances. And we, you know, we did train for it. Uh, leading up to Rio, we started to, you know, anticipate the change to two kilometres. Um, and I know all the athletes in the programme, uh, GB, and I'm sure lots of the other established programmes will be training towards two kilometres, um, where typically in the single, you know, the events are sort of nine to ten minutes long, up to 11 minutes, potentially for some of the, the, for the women's events, depending on, you know, the, the conditions. But, um, yeah, it na naturally becomes a much more endurance based. Um, and what we've seen with the times is typically the times have almost just been double so people are going the same speeds but for, for double the distance which is pretty incredible um and just testament to the sort of hard work and you know how much they're putting into these events to try and be right at the top absolutely and and great so we move on now from, from the single to the double the the mixed double scales for pr2 we've got lauren rules and and lauren Whitley, and obviously we've touched on on ben's world record lauren's just someone else who's been smashing world records left right and center yeah, yeah, Lauren uh, is a phenomenal athlete. Um, so she's had a very tough first two years of this cycle, 2017, 2018, uh, like going into 2019, surgeries after surgeries. And then she's come back. She's got the mental resilience like no other um, to get her up there and to be the best in the world. And I think she's kind of, she's had certain surgeries that have allowed her to then to train harder, so carpal tunnel sur surgery, which has then uh, made that, meant that she's able to push herself harder because it was restricting her a bit more bit while training and she's just turned into an absolute weapon and uh we used to call her swalsey and she's definitely uh definitely swalsey right now <laughs> uh, she's yeah and she's just got a head that she just wants to be perfect everything every stroke that she takes she's putting everything into it and that's what's making her uh the phenomenal athlete that she's she is becoming day in day out yeah i think she's another one as well where you've really been able to see the progression she came came to the program you probably remember grace as a, as a teenager i think she was sort of 17 <laughs> yeah. 18 almost um still doing her sort of a levels and um you know she obviously had real belief in herself and competed in you know wheelchair racing and uh really a bit like ben just threw us threw herself into the sport and she you know trains like uh not, not many other athletes really she's got such great determination and real fire that you know you see every repetition in the gym every training session she she absolutely hits it 100%, um, and she's got a real fire and, and hunger to try and get herself back to the, the top of that event. And we've seen that the last couple of years, they've been able to really pull themselves back through the field um, after missing the sort of first couple of years of this sort of four or five year cycle now. Um, so she was, you know, really, really high hopes on trying to replicate their their success from from Rio. Yeah, definitely. It's Grace. It's another. It's another really exciting element of this Paris squad is that. We've got three boats who could potentially all win gold medals. So it's, um, I guess it puts a lot of pressure on, on Lawrence and, and Lauren coming from their performance that they had at, at Rio, but they're, they're more than capable of delivering gold uh, come Tokyo. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, uh, so Lauren's very young, she's 23 in the squad and then Lawrence is, uh, will be turning 30 while he's out there. So even though they're still relatively young, they're really experienced in, in within the crew. Um, so not only are they kind of young in, young in age, but they're mentoring all the new people in the PR4 category. Um, and yeah, Lauren's definitely an athlete to look, look to the side and go, OK, I want to I want to train like her. I want to be like her. Um, and it's a really exciting element having that's the crew that's obviously exactly the same. So the four's changed. Uh, top ben is now new into it. And that's the, the exact same crew. So it's really exciting watching this, what they've been able to do over the over the years that like they've had their own challenges 
Lawrence is Lawrence is obviously had his, his own challenges as well. With Lauren being ill, he's had to train for the first year. There wasn't a single for him to race in. So he's he had this a lot in the lead into Rio where we were desperate to find a girl and we finally found Lauren and we we had the flyers out, get let find find Lawrence a girl <laughs> <laughs> um to for him to race with. And and then he's had to put himself back into that place again where he's training, knowing he's not going to have a race at the end of the season. Um and I think that's quite hard in the para world. Uh, there's less events for you to race in and um, so I think Lawrence has just had to get his head down to train knowing he won't be having that like any of the joy at the end of it and um, so it's a big credit to him that over the two three years while Lawrence's been having to have a step back from it he's had to kind of have his own challenges in a very different way um, and those two with a very very different personalities and they just click when they're on the water and it's a real like excitement to watch them two race. I think I'd like to also say, I think Lauren's now got the keys. Uh, so she sat at the stroke seat and that's a big step forward. We used to call that joke about us being bow girls and uh, she's now taking the keys and leading Lawrence down that track. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence is going to have to hang on for dear life, I reckon. He's hanging on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he certainly will. But, but Tom, who else is going to be in, in medal contention then in the, in the mixed double? Yeah, so the mixed double. I think the first first couple of years of this cycle we really saw the Dutch breakthrough. Um, uh, the Dutch pairing from um, from Rio, they, they they came fourth, which is obviously pretty heartbreaking. And they really turned it around in 2017, 18, and and really blew the field away. Uh, and they've got some really strong athletes. And then obviously Lawrence and Lauren had a, their, their their kind of challenges over those years and able to break through and 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 kind of get ahead of the Dutch. So. I think the Dutch will be looking for, you know, revenge uh, and really looking to push the, the GB boat. Um, so I think Dutch will be the strongest contenders. France as well, they've got a really good pairing, lots of experience, uh, two very strong athletes as well, very, very um, experienced athletes. They'll be looking to, to really contest um, for those medals as well. Um, but you can never discount sort of the, the pairing from Ukraine as well and potentially China, who we haven't seen uh, much of at all in these, these past sort of four or five years. The Chinese tend to come out uh, and, and they've typically got some pretty strong strong crews um, and don't tend to show their hand until quite last minute. So I'm sure the Chinese will be up, up and amongst the mix looking for those those medals as well. Um, obviously having come away with, with the silver um, in, in 2016. Yeah, you do wonder if we're going to see a similar Chinese outfit that we saw in the, the women's eight that raced at the Olympics appearing at the final Olympic qualification for Gaza and then uh, and pouring admirably at the, at the Olympics as well. But we've got one more boat to look at. We've got the... Uh, the, the PR3 mixed Cox 4, which is, I think it's fair to say, the dominant for, for a decade now. And without jinxing it or um, putting too much pressure on them, they're, they're certainly favourites for gold, and it's very much theirs to lose, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll probably feel that sort of air of expectation and, and that little bit of pressure. Um, but they've had a fantastic unbeaten run. I think, you know, during my time on the team, I can only really remember them losing a race thing to the world in 2007. I think they've got... A, Silver, Beijing was a bronze. It's going back a few years now. Um, the world in 2010, I think, was the last event that they didn't didn't manage to win, and they got silver at the Worlds there. And ever since 2010, they've been on this winning streak. And um, I think the squad has had such you know depth and strength, and I'm sure Grace will be able to chip in here. That since it's moved to two kilometres, it's almost favoured them more. Um, and we've really seen you know uh, in the past year, a couple of seasons, they've been able to really take that event and step it on even further. Um, and really create their own their own standard in that event. And they've been a standout crew that were, I'm sure will be looking to produce a gold medal performance there and, and, and try and really blow blow the field away and, and really stamp their mark on that event. But yeah, Grace, the, the PR3 makes Cox for the same flagship of the of the of the power rowing squad and um, undoubtedly favourites for for the gold medal. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. There, um, I think we saw a few um, world records go at the Olympics, and I would have thought that if the weather's right and the conditions are right, they they will be wanting to put show out what they've done for this last two years. They've been working hard on those land training on the ergs. There's been some big scores, and they are definitely there to be um, about to kind of stamp their authority and go, look, this is what we've done. Um, come and come and challenge us for Paris. I think that's what they're going to be kind of showing the world. Yeah, absolutely. And and Tom, we've got obviously the British crew ahead of the rest of the field, but but who are the others who basically who's going to get the minor medals? Who's going to be the bridesmaids in the in the mixed Cox four event? Touchwood, obviously, that uh, the British yes. come away with the gold. 
Yeah, providing, uh, you know, GB, the, the guys do what they're expected um, and, and come away with that gold medal. Um, obviously, it's never a given, but I'm sure if they produce their, their best on the day, they will be sort of really dominating that field. But um, for the minor medals, I think we'd be looking um, potentially, um, it could be, you know, close, close, fascinating, uh, fascinating race between um, France. They've had a pretty established four, I think, for a couple of years now. Um, then they're really looking, I think, to try and, you know, match their double and, and try and get into that medal zone. So the French crew, I'm sure, would be pretty strong. Uh, you can never discount the USA, potentially Canada, depending on how their preparations have been. Uh, and I'm sure Ukraine as well, obviously, with, you know, a couple of strong events. We've got, obviously, Roman Polyansky in the single and, and a pretty handy double as well. I think Ukraine are, are looking to try and push that four into the medal zone as well. So you can never discount, discount those. But um, it should be an interesting interesting fight for the, for the minor medals I'm sure definitely and and Grace just away from the predictions and away from the the, the spinning aside from from winning Paralympic gold what were some of the moments that stood out to you when uh, when you represented Great Britain at the Paralympic Games um so I think for me I remember the bit that it kind of all felt real was actually sat at the closing ceremony um, and just kind of reflecting on what we've all just been through. Obviously, as a, as a team in Rio, we got three golds and, and a bronze medal, and it was the highest, uh, highest on the table and the best they'd ever produced. Um, and so it's just been part of such a phenomenal team that you could just be really, really proud of. When you're in the midst of the racing, I, de I definitely felt like I was a bit on a, a bit kind of just work mode, like you're, this is, you're there to race, you're there to do that. And I found that sitting in the closest ceremony was the time where I could reflect and enjoy the fact that I'd just been able to experience my experience Paralympic game a dream come true and obviously come away as a Paralympic champion was just like the icing icing on the cake um obviously there's one boat that we do not have racing there in in this year and so the GB team are always looking for a PR1 woman and um, so as Tom described earlier on if, if anyone's watching and thinks that that might be them I think they might have it in the next three years then definitely get yourself onto the British Rowing website and register your interest because we would love to have a full team out there uh, representing in Paris. Yeah, definitely. And and Tom, to, to give you the final words of a similar question that I gave to, to Grace, aside from winning Paralympic gold, what's been the, sort of the, the highlight that you've had at, at the Paralympic Games? Yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, you know, I was so lucky to have gone to three games. Um, some of them are, you know, really positive experiences with Beijing and obviously having the disappointment of London. But I think that Rio cycle, you know, was was pretty special. Those four years being part of a such a strong team, um, especially in those last few years, it's everyone supporting each other and coming away with, uh, you know, four results that were so special. Um, you know, I really reflect back on on the, the, those four years. Uh, and potentially knowing I was going to finish my, my career and coming away with a, a bronze medal, it was almost, it felt at the time like winning a gold, you know, having to, you know, beat, beat the athlete from China uh, who won in London 2012 to, to, to just get in that medal zone. Um, and, you know, it just gives me real sort of pride looking back and just being part of such a successful team um, that's obviously, you know, built this sort of legacy through, you know, the hard work of, you know, Tom Dyson and Nick Baker and, and the GB Rowan team that are just luckily obviously lucky to be supported by the National Lottery. Um, and, you know, I'm really, really looking forward to seeing how the guys perform, you know, in, in less than a week's time. So fingers crossed for the whole of the GB Para Rowing team. And of course, the Paralympic Games start next week on the 24th of August, but you'll have to wait until the 27th for the rowing to kick off. But now my huge thanks to Grace and Tom for joining us for this version of the debrief and join us next week as we review all the Paralympic action out in Tokyo.